On behalf of President Mary Hendricks and our entire board of advisors, welcome to the Body and Bill Stubblefield Institute for Civil Political Communications at Shepherd University. I'm David Welch, the Institute's inaugural director. The purpose of the Stubblefield Institute is to study and improve the level of political discourse, civility, and civic engagement in today's somewhat divisive nation. Tonight's program featuring delegates John Doyle and Paul Espinoza is presented by the Institute's Community Engagement Committee. This important bipartisan committee is chaired by Ross Curtis and consists of leaders in Berkeley and Jefferson counties. We look forward to a lively civil discussion with a focus on the upcoming legislative agenda in Charleston beginning on February 10th. We are very fortunate tonight to have Matthew Umstead as our moderator. Matthew has worked in journalism for more than 20 years, including news reporting work at the Herald Mail, the Journal, and the Observer Reporter in Washington, Pennsylvania. Matt Umstead began his career in media with the Daily Athenium, an independent student-run newspaper at West Virginia University. He went on to work for the online division of USA Today before returning to Morgantown to help launch The Mountain Ear, a tabloid style 10,000 circulation news publication with fellow WVU alum, now social media executive, Kelly Ann Collins. One program about tonight's forum. If you want to ask a question, please submit it to the chat function. Our communications and events manager, Sarah Burke, will select as many questions as possible. Your video and microphones will not be on. This is for obvious security and possible disruptive purposes. Matthew, it's all yours. Thank you for your time, energy, and expertise. Thank you for that kind introduction, David. Tonight, we're joined again by Delegate uh, John Doyle and Delegate uh, Paul Espinosa. Democrat uh, Doyle represents six, uh, District, District 67 in the West Virginia House of Delegates. He is in his 25th year in that body. Doyle grew up in Charlestown and holds a bachelor's degree from Shepherd University where he majored in political science and minored in history. For 10 years, he sold college textbooks for a living and was a realtor with Coldwell Banker and later ERA Realty for 20 years. Doyle is a former president of the Eastern Panhandle Transit Authority and was a board member of what is now the Eastern Panhandle Empowerment Center. He sings Celtic folk songs and was a downhill ski instructor for 25 years. Republican Espinosa uh, represents District 66 in the 100 seat house and serves as House Majority Whip. First elected in 2012, Espinosa serves as House Majority Whip, as I said, and is a member of the powerful rules and finance committees, among other assignments. A public affairs manager, Espinosa is a past president of the Jefferson County Chamber of Commerce, the Jefferson County Parks and Recreation Commission, and the Rotary Club of Charlestown. Born in Ransom, West Virginia, Espinosa is also a past board member of the United Way of the Eastern Panhandle and previously served as a member of the Jefferson County Development Authority. Espinosa also is a 1984 graduate of West Virginia Wesleyan College. Good evening, gentlemen. Good evening, Matt. Good to be with you. Good, Good to be with you all. Uh, and welcome everybody who is uh, attending, uh, has, who has joined us for this uh, event tonight. I appreciate uh, your interest and, uh, and your questions. Uh, first, an opening question for, for you all, uh, for you both, and a little bit of an introduction, just to, just to uh, remind everyone where, the, where the, the lay of the land is politically in Charleston, heading into the uh, first session of the 85th legislature. Republicans now hold 77 of the 100 seats in the House of Delegates and 23 of the 34 seats in the State Senate. Uh, what is the effect of the GOP having a, uh, an arguable supermajority? And, and, and from the Democratic perspective, how do Democrats navigate the circumstances of being vastly outnumbered? Uh, Delegate Espinosa, feel free to go first, please. Well, thank you, Matt, and uh, good evening, Delegate Doyle. Good to be with you as well. Uh, I do want to start out at the outset uh, thanking the Community Engagement Committee for hosting this evening's forum and looking forward to a productive dialogue this evening. As far as uh, having supermajorities, and this is uh, probably the first time that we've had supermajorities uh, since 
uh, well, uh, decades, uh, probably eight or nine decades, I think. Uh, Delegate Doyle, I know you've spoken about that before, so you might have a little more precise answer as far as how long uh, how long it's been since uh, since we've had supermajorities. But um, you know, I, I'd say probably uh, put simply, Matt, it really provides us an opportunity to uh, you know think big uh, by having uh, supermajorities. Uh, uh, passing resolutions, for example, considering constitutional amendments, which are, are some issues that we have looked at uh, previously, but those do require two thirds uh, votes, uh, affirmative votes in both chambers, both the House and the Senate, in order to put those type of questions before the uh, before the voters. Happy to talk with some of those, talk about some of those uh, during the course of the evening. But by having uh, 77 seats in the uh, House and uh, 23 uh, seats in the Senate, it does provide the necessary margins in order to be able to uh, take up some of those type of items. So I'd say in a nutshell, Matt, it just really allows us to really think big. Now, uh, certainly welcome the opportunity to uh, continue to work with our colleagues across the aisle. I think um, I can speak on behalf of our speaker, uh, House, uh, House Speaker Roger Hanshaw and our Majority Leader Amy Summers in saying that you know, if uh, we're looking for good ideas for West Virginia, regardless of where they come from. And so uh, certainly we'll continue our efforts to reach across the aisle. If there are good, uh, good ideas, uh, you know, we'll certainly uh, be happy to consider those. But it does give us the, uh, the majorities, uh, the governing majorities in order to, to really take up some comprehensive, uh, wide ranging reform. Delegate Doyle, you, you were part of a, a very large majority of Democrats at one time, were you not? And, and this is a little bit of a flip of, and the, of a coin in this situation for you now. Um, it is, Matthew. And, uh, uh, oh, okay, there, this, some, pardon me, uh, uh, a message appeared on the screen which distracted me, I apologize. Uh, yeah, uh, and Paul, hi, how are you? I'm glad, glad to be on with you. Uh, it's, um, uh, yeah, I was in on, on in a number of, of uh, years when we had super majorities. Uh, and the answer is you can do, if you got the super majority, you can do anything you want if you can hold your caucus together. Now, that's not always the easiest thing in the world to do because the bigger the caucus gets, the more opinions there are in it. And the more difficult it is to keep everybody behind a particular opinion. So uh, it, it, there, there were times when we needed Republican support to get things through. Uh, and uh, three of the four speakers uh, uh, with whom I served, uh, Bob Kiss, Chuck Chambers, and, uh, and Clyde C., uh, even though we had super majorities, made it a point to reach out to Republicans whenever they could uh, a, because they thought it made sense to do that, and also because they knew that on occasion they might need them. Uh, so uh, th that, that's the dynamic. Now, we'll, we'll see how it plays out. One of the big questions that's been looming, and I, I think, Delegate Espinosa, you, you may want to answer this first again for this question. There's been already reports about phasing out the uh, personal income tax, and we know it's a rather large chunk of the budget, but many West Virginians also loathe that tax uh, for various reasons, whether it's a small business producing chocolate candies or it's a, uh, uh, you know, a vehicle owner that doesn't understand why their 10-year-old car is still uh, got a very sizable uh, tax bill attached to it. Um, is this a realistic item? Uh, that we can really, truly, as citizens, everyday citizens out there in the state, uh, can see some, some maybe some reductions in the personal income tax, and and whether it would be responsible to do amid the uh, uncharted territory we're in uh, amid the pandemic. Well, Matt, I can tell you that we are looking at it very, very seriously, and. Uh, certainly am pleased that Governor Justice has expressed on a number of occasions, I think just uh, just really within the last week, uh, once again expressed his support for um, 
you know, taking action to eventually transition away from the personal income tax, or at the very least, uh, to reduce that. As you note, Matt, uh, certainly it is a considerable uh, portion of our budget. However, um, you know, I think it's something that, uh, you know, that, that we really do need to seriously consider. I think if you look at some of the states around the country that uh, have transitioned away from the personal income tax, you are seeing uh, growth in their economy. Uh, it certainly provides uh, some additional incentives for individuals to locate in West Virginia. Sadly, uh, as a result of the most recent census, and it, uh, we've seen a continuation really of a trend where West Virginia is one of the few states in the country that is declining in population. And so as we you know, look for ways to reduce that uh, or re reverse that trend, uh, uh, addressing uh, the uh, personal income tax and tax reform in general, certainly at the top of our list of things that, uh, that we're looking at. Uh, if you look at uh, you know, our, our recent uh, sessions uh, since 2015, when Republicans took control of the uh, House and Senate, uh, you know, we, we've addressed a number of areas uh, that, that I think are important to uh, establish a good, uh, inviting, uh, not only business climate, but a climate where uh, hopefully folks will want to locate in West Virginia. We've, uh, we've uh, enacted quite a bit of legal reform, uh, particularly in tort reform. We've passed legislation that requires regular review of all of our regulations. At one time, West Virginia recognizes one of the most uh, regulation uh, heavy uh, states in the country. Well, now we require regular review of all regulations just to make sure that they still make sense. But probably the one area where we haven't done uh, uh, as much as we would like is in the area of tax reform. And uh, as we speak, uh, our, our House finance leadership, as well as our Senate leadership and the governor staff are looking very, very closely at how can we uh, put West Virginia on a glide path to uh, providing that needed personal income tax relief for West Virginians. So the West Virginians have been, frankly, put more money in their pockets as opposed to continuing to fund um, uh, ever-growing government. Delegate Doyle, what's your take? Is it a little bit too precarious of a time amid the, the pandemic to, to tackle this issue, or, or are you on board? Uh, it's a very bad idea. Uh, and, and I think it's a bad idea, a bad idea, period, for any time. Uh, it, it is it, it is seriously fiscally irresponsible uh, because and it, why would you say that? I'm I, well, I was about to to say that before okay. you asked me the question there, Matthew. Go ahead, sir. Uh, the if there are two ways you can go about this. One is to try and replace it with some other tax, and what I've heard is replace it with an increase in the sales tax. If we have to replace all of that money with an increase in the sales tax. We'll have the highest sales tax in the country. And I think that will do two things. One, it will seriously penalize low-income people, uh, of which West Virginia has a lot. And secondly, I think it will do serious damage to our tourism industry uh, when we have to have a, a, a sales tax that high. So uh, to me, the idea of doing away with the income tax is, is essentially it's a proposal to reward people for being rich. And I don't mind somebody being rich, but I, I think everybody should pay their share of taxes. And if you rely heavily on the sales tax, it really, it, it's the most regressive tax you can come up with. And incidentally, Matthew, you used an example, which I, I think was not appropriate for the income tax. You talked about a 10 year old car. Uh, that, that really doesn't affect the income tax. I am in favor of doing away with the car tax. Okay. I think doing away with that tax would put money in the hands of people who would spend it. People who are primarily West Virginians, primarily low income people, this will benefit heavily. And, and incidentally, uh, what it would do for businesses is it would, if someone owns a business and they've registered the vehicle with the business, it would be perfectly legal for that person to once uh, the idea of doing away with the car tax passes, to transfer the title of the vehicle from the business to the individual, and therefore the, essentially the business would get a tax break too. So uh, I, I think that's the kind 
of tax reform that we ought to be looking at. Delegate Espinosa, are, are those sales tax uh, increases that uh, uh, Delegate uh, Doyle mentioned accurate? Well, it's it's not the first time we've heard that the sky is falling if uh, if we enact uh, reforms down at the legislature. We had to contend with that uh, during some of the education reform that we enacted, and uh, despite the fact that we did offer that we did uh, enact a, a pretty comprehensive. Uh, education reform package just two years ago uh, certainly um, you know uh, hasn't had the dire uh, effect that that some folks uh, uh, cautioned that it might. I think uh, we do have to take a uh, a measured approach to uh, you know eliminating the personal income tax. Uh, first, let me say, Matt, that you know I'm not an economist and I and I don't uh, I don't uh, 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 you know suggest that I'm uh, uh, you know, I'm an expert on, on all the intricacies of various tax policies, but the, the studies that I have seen so far suggest that you can provide some meaningful uh, personal income tax relief, again, allowing individuals to keep more of their hard-earned dollars uh, uh, in exchange for a modest uh, increase in consumption tax. And, uh, you know, one, I think one of the rationales for looking at the possibility of perhaps uh, uh, adjusting the, the consumption tax is that that allows everyone to contribute uh, to uh, the revenues that we need in West Virginia. I think it's, uh, you know, if, if you think about it, uh, there is a significant part of West Virginia's economy and, and uh, perhaps uh, any, uh, any state that, uh, you know, has what, you know, what's referred to as a cash economy. Folks that uh, you know, are paid cash for their services, uh, perhaps are, are not, uh, you know, paying significantly into the personal income tax by transitioning to a, a consumption tax, basically where uh, everybody pays for the services that, w that they uh, utilize with certain exemptions, uh, certainly uh, the tax on food, for example, I think that's something that's been eliminated years ago uh, with uh, with Republicans, I think that's something that uh, would agree. It would uh, perhaps be regressive if we were to, you know, try to reenact that. But I think there are ways to do it where you're able to capture some additional revenue that's, you know, that's not uh, really being collected today. So uh, I do think that there, uh, you know, again, we can certainly continue to do things uh, the way they are now. Uh, again, we're one of the few states in the country that's losing population. Um, you know, I, I think. Uh, the fact that both the House, the Senate, and the governor are looking very seriously uh, at uh, uh, providing some needed tax relief, uh, I'm optimistic that we can, you know, at least uh, begin that process of uh, transitioning into a fair uh, uh, taxation model that will attract uh, folks to West Virginia. Let's uh, switch gears a little bit here. Uh, uh, Matthew, if I go could, ahead, if go if ahead. I could follow what, up what, on that. Go ahead. The, the proposal that's being offered is almost identical to the idea that Kansas adopted about a half a dozen years ago. And there, not only did their economy go further in the tank, they went in the, the state went in the tank fiscally and they're still trying to recover from it. Uh, I just think it would be a very bad idea. And Paul says, well, with a consumption tax, everyone contributes. He's right, everyone's contributing now. And I think folks on the low end of the, of, of, of the economic spectrum are contributing enough now. I, ever since the Republicans took over about six years ago, we've heard different, different ideas that we have been put in place. Uh, we're gonna do away with the corporate income tax. We're gonna do away with the franchise tax. Uh, we're gonna have right to work. We're gonna, we're gonna do away with prevailing wage. And each one of those was advocated as it's going to turn West Virginia's economy around. It hasn't. Not only do we continue to lose population, we are still 49th in the nation in per capita income. So, so what is so what is your what is your uh, suggestions for reversing that tide of population decline, which has continued to bleed out the rest of the state, albeit not here in the Eastern Panhandle, but still weighs on our abilities to respond to growth with limited 
uh, state uh, funding. Which, what are your idea, uh, tax ideas to try to reverse this population de decline? The Senate President Blair has this uh, goal of increasing the state's population by 400,000 people over the next 10 years, apparently, according to a, a published report here. What, what are your ideas, Delegate Doyle? Well, as I mentioned, one, and that is to do away with the car tax. Okay. I think that is the one tax change we could make that would get us more bang for the buck than any other one that has been proposed. But let me add on to that. The real issue is not taxes. Most people do not move someplace or another because of the tax structure. Uh, the jobs are created where you have an educated workforce. And that is where we have fallen down in West Virginia. We simply do not put enough money into K-12 education and into higher education. Until we do that, we're going to continue to bounce around the bottom of the economy. Let's go there for a second. Education reform, as you noticed, uh, last uh, session was pretty, uh, you know, there was a lot of discussion about uh, charter schools. Um, you know, obviously, uh, Delegate Espinosa, that's probably going to maybe resurface again this session. I, I don't know, but I don't know what the majority's uh, platform is entirely, but on that on that topic. But what can we do to change our education system, Delegate Doyle? You've been around the block for 25 years. You, you've, you've, obviously are very familiar with Shepherd, the local university there. I mean, uh, the enrollments have dropped again at Shepherd University. Uh, enrollments have dropped everywhere and, and, and school districts across the state because the population is declining. Uh, what are we not, what do we need to do to, to make our education system stronger? Uh, I don't know. What are, what are your solutions for that? I mean, we, we can't just keep throwing, throwing money at the problem. Well, can't but we? we haven't done that. We have the lowest paid teachers in the country almost. And that that just simply, and as long as we have that, we're not going to be able to keep enough quality teachers in the classroom, particularly the veteran ones. We, we're, we have a, a, a decent starting salary and we are able to keep every year enough, uh, enough of a pipeline of good young teachers coming in, but they don't stay very long. Well, how do we how do we how do, how do we convince the unions then to allow school boards to reward the excellent teachers with higher pay? I don't think the unions are the problem. Uh, certainly, the AFT is not the problem. The AFT has come out and and, and has said that they're okay with locality pay. Uh, it's uh, are uh, they? I, are oh they? yes, oh yes, they have. I've, I've had many conversations with them. It, it's not the unions that are the problem. It's this belief that if you let areas like the Eastern Panhandle and Montegalia County and the Northern Panhandle have enough, have salaries high enough to keep people from leaving, that somehow it hurts people in the coal fields. It doesn't, but that it, 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 it's kind of like, it's a mindset that, that needs to be broken through. And I've been trying for 20 years to break through it, and I do it with uh, one conversation after another. Uh, and and um, uh, we're just gonna have to, have to keep doing that. But, but let, me, let me add to this. Before we do that now, we're gonna have to have one more round of major pay raises across the board. It needs to be about 10% across the board. Because remember, the last time we gave them a big pay raise, we actually dropped one notch because all of the other bottom feeders saw what West Virginia was doing and, and passed bigger increases than we did. That is the problem, Matt. Delegate Espinosa, what's your take? Do we, we need to give an across the board 10% raised or, 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 or do you wanna take on the union response that he, that he offered first? Which, which one do you wanna take on? Go ahead. Well, uh, first, uh, I'm glad to uh, hear that, uh, that John acknowledged the fact that we did pass a significant pay raise as a matter of fact, we did pass the two largest pay raises in state history without raising taxes. So, you know, I think I look back to uh, my time in the legislature since 2013. You know, would often see very under Democratic leadership. You know, would either you know see a one or maybe a two percent pay raise. Uh, several years, uh, no pay raise at all. But again, we did we did offer some significant pay raises. Uh, let me say this, Matt. I mean, I. 
I certainly applaud all those associated with our public school systems uh, who are striving to educate our children under extremely challenging conditions. But, you know, I do think that uh, certainly uh, uh, parents uh, and students uh, want to see some, some results of uh, some of the additional investments we've made. Uh, if you look back to the comprehensive uh, education reform legislation we passed uh, two years ago, uh, we provided an additional $130 million of additional funding uh, for public education in West Virginia. Now, uh, one of the flexibilities we provided in that comprehensive uh, education reform was flexibility for our local school districts to be able to offer dif differential pay uh, to help fill hard to fill positions. We often hear about the difficulty our school districts are having uh, attracting and retaining quality math teachers, science teachers. Well, again, uh, the legislation that we enacted just two years ago provided just that flex flexibility so that districts can in fact uh, provide differential pay to help fill those hard to fill positions and also provided some additional uh, funding, uh, a portion of it in block grants so, so that districts could utilize those dollars uh, to assist in those areas. Does, Recently, Delegate, I reached... does Delegate Duell though have a point, does he have a point by say, that, that saying that we need to give another across the board 10% raise to teachers to remain competitive in the current environment? Well, I, all, I absolutely support uh, continuing to uh, try to enhance our teacher pay because, I mean, we, we see what's around us in Northern Virginia, Maryland, and Pennsylvania. We know that our teachers can go just across the border. So I certainly uh, support continuing to offer uh, or, or, or doing our best to uh, um, provide additional pay. But what I was about to uh, point out, uh, Matt, was that we provided flexibility for our school districts to help fill those positions. I recently uh, reached out to the Department of Education to ask how many school districts have taken advantage of that flexibility we provided uh, two years ago. And, and the answer, that? unfortunately, is that none of them have taken advantage of that flexibility. So why you know, is that? Why is uh, well, I think it's I think it's uh, certainly frustrating that we, we provide the the uh, flexibility. I think sometimes uh, there's a, there's a reluctance uh, to step away from the one size fits all uh, pay approach. I know the uh, teachers associations and the school service uh, personnel often that the existed providing uh, pay differential. Again, we we made the tough vote two years ago to provide that flexibility. But again, our school districts simply have not uh, utilized that flexibility. So again, while certainly as we continue to grow our economy, and, and again, despite the pandemic, we are seeing good signs in the economy. That obviously is, is important if we are able to, if we are to provide additional pay raises for our teachers and other state employees, we have to grow our economy. And that's why we're so focused on uh, uh, implementing uh, uh, legislation that we'll do just that so that we have the resources to provide uh, better salaries, more competitive salaries for our teachers and school service personnel. Where are education issues in this year's agenda for the, the session coming up? Is it is What is on the agenda for education? Do we, is there a raise being talked about for teachers? Uh, as far as you know, you're on. You're in the leadership of the of the House uh, GOP. There, uh, I mean, is there any other further reforms that you all are looking at? I mean, to, to kind of weed out bad teachers, or uh, you know, address uh, some of the regulations that are kind of holding school districts back at times. Well, Matt, we'll receive the governor's budget on February 10th when we return down to the uh, Capitol uh, to begin the 60 60 day uh, session in earnest. Uh, do anticipate that the governor will provide a state of the state address, perhaps more, uh, perhaps in a virtual uh, setting as opposed to uh, the, the the typical setting. But that's when we'll see, you know, what the governor's budget proposal is, and and uh, whether he is, uh, you know, provided for uh, an employee pay raise. Again, while we're certainly uh, pleased that the impact of the pandemic has not been as uh, severe as we had hoped, uh, whether or not. Uh, we'll be able to provide a pay raise in the budget uh, again remains to be seen. As far as some of the other reforms, I'll just say briefly that uh, again, while certainly applaud our school districts for you know trying to serve our children under very trying circumstances, there's simply no reason to continue to deny our parents and students uh, the school the school choice options available 
uh, elsewhere in the quad state area and across the, the nation and certainly look forward to taking up legislation and supporting legislation that will provide our parents and students additional options. I think another area that uh, we'll continue to look at uh, in an area where I've certainly been able to play a leadership role in, um, uh, in recent years is providing greater autonomy for our higher education institutions and providing more equitable funding for uh, both Blue Ridge and Shepherd University that historically have been among the lowest funded institutions on a per capita basis compared to their peers. So I think those are some of the things in the uh, higher education area uh, that we'll certainly continue to work on trying to close that gap between uh, how Blue Ridge and Shepherd are funded and uh, some of their peer institutions across the state. Delegate Doyle, what, do you, what is your party's take on education uh, coming into this session? Are you all going to push for that raise that you talked about for teachers? Or uh, what is your what are you hearing among your fellow Democrats uh, as far as education uh, issues go? Well, I certainly hope so. Uh, I've had a number of discussions with my fellow Democrats and, and a whole lot of people seem on board with the idea. We'll, we'll see when we get there. Uh, I, a, a couple of points I want to make on, on what Paul has said. First of all, Paul is right. Two years ago, we did pass actually a version of locality pay. It's not a lot, but it's a start. We broke the ice with it, and he had a lot to do with it, and I commend him for it. Uh, secondly, uh, when he talked about the two largest teacher pay raises, that is true technically, but not really. Uh, it's true only in terms of hard dollars. It doesn't match uh, the raises that were given uh, when Gaston Caperton was governor after the first teacher strike. Uh, in terms of, of constant dollars, it was much, much more money then, and certainly in terms of the percentage of increase. We went from pretty much near the bottom back then, after a three-year program, we got up to almost the national average in terms of teacher salaries. So I think we need to aim for that again. Uh, one other point uh, and about higher ed, uh, Matthew, you mentioned Shepherd losing enrollment. This is happening with four-year institutions around the country. I don't know whether you've been paying attention to what's been going on in Pennsylvania, but uh, Pennsylvania is seriously considering taking the six tertiary institutions in the western half of the state and merging them into two. Uh, uh, you would have essentially, it would be uh, the University of Western Pennsylvania would be the generic term, which would have Edinburgh, Slippery Rock, and Clarion. Uh, and then you would have uh, a, a central Pennsylvania university with Mansfield, Lock Haven, uh, and uh, I, uh, I, I forget what the other one is, but, it, but at any rate, they're losing, they're losing enrollment so badly. One of those institutions over the last five years has lost 47% of its enrollment. This is the kind of thing that's going on around the country. And I don't know what, why, and I don't know what to do about it, but it's got to stop. We've got to get people back in college. That's all there is to it. Matt, if I could uh, respond briefly sure. to uh, to a comment that um, that uh, Delegate Doyle made, you know, he referenced uh, Governor Caperton's uh, 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 proposed pay raise. Uh, but as I recall, and again, that was before my time in the legislature, but it's my understanding that that uh, pay raise was accompanied by a pretty substantial uh, tax increase on, on West Virginians. The two uh, pay raises that we enacted uh, in recent years, five uh, percent and two successive years. Again, those 5% raises uh, compared to one or 2% raises in only a couple years uh, under a democratic uh, leadership uh, prior to us taking the majority in 2015. Again, uh, we're in fact the, the largest uh, pay raises in state history without a tax increase. And I think that's uh, gonna continue to be the approach that we take. Uh, I don't uh, think there's gonna be support in our caucus at least uh, for increasing the tax burden uh, on hard uh, working West Virginians. I think uh, on the contrary, I, I think there's gonna be a desire uh, in conjunction with uh, continued economic growth to provide uh, tax relief uh, for, for West Virginians. Matthew, uh, Paul's right about that. Uh, it did involve uh, doubling 
the sales tax. Uh, but my point was, it's misleading to say that the pay raise we passed two years ago was the, one of the two largest in state history. It is only if you look at dollars that are even, not in constant dollars and not in terms of a percentage of increase over what people were making before. Let's switch gears a little bit here. Regarding the COVID pandemic and the governor's handling of, of, the, of the matter uh, under the guise of, of, of executive orders, do you anticipate some bipartisanship in uh, taking a look at the governor's authority in that regard uh, and possibly kind of trying to rein in his, his power there? Or do you, are you all generally uh, satisfied with his handling of the maps and the, the various closures of, of businesses and, and keeping the uh, young children uh, home uh, you know, from school, even though the studies and the research apparently are showing that they're the least at risk? What's your take on that, Delegate Espinosa? Well, I think all in all, I think the governor, I think, has, a, uh, I think, managed the uh, pandemic, uh, you know, in a, in a reasonably good way. However, I do believe that uh, there uh, uh, will be bipartisan support, at least there will be strong support in the Republican caucus for reexamining, uh, you know, some of the authorities the governor uh, has. Um, you know, I think one of the things that we want to be very careful uh, as we look at uh, perhaps uh, you know, revisiting some of those authorities under states of emergency is that we don't want to tie the hands of a governor. You know, if when you really look at it, in in most cases, the types of states of emergency that West Virginia has experienced and is likely to continue to experience are natural disasters where you have flooding, you know, in areas of West Virginia. And again, the last thing we want to do is to delay the governor in responding to those type of things. However, uh, so, do anticipate that there's going to be legislation uh, that will be introduced that will, you know, uh, specify, you know, the the time frames uh, uh, for uh, states of emergency, uh, the uh, points at which the legislature uh, would be required to call in to, uh, you know, provide, uh, you know, advice and uh, consent uh, for expenditures. So do anticipate that that will be the case. Matt, I think another area uh, that uh, I'm really uh, excited about is really trying to address some of the flexibilities that the governor has offered uh, through executive orders. Uh, for example, in the area of telehealth, uh, through executive order, the governor has provided uh, flexibilities uh, in that area and uh, in a host of other areas, uh, a number of them in the hospitality areas dealing with alcohol, uh, for example. Uh, I think where it's been demonstrated that those flexibilities, uh, you know, have not been an issue, uh, you know, I think you're going to see uh, uh, a significant amount of legislation that will make those reforms uh, permanent so that uh, mm -hmm. we can continue uh, to provide uh, some of the freedom and flexibility that, again, we've demonstrated uh, through the pandemic uh, that we can do uh, without uh, putting West Virginians at risk. So I think that's another area where you're going to see quite a bit of legislation uh, to, again, make some of those freedoms uh, permanent. And I think we'll even go beyond that. Uh, I know I've heard from uh, a number of businesses in the hospitality areas, uh, uh, services that they would love to be able to provide uh, their, uh, their visitors, their customers. And I think there'll be opportunities to, again, uh, make sure that we are not at a competitive disadvantage with our surrounding uh, tourism industries. Delegate Doyle, what's your take on that? Do you think the governor has over, overstepped his authority this past year, or are you generally uh, pleased with how he's handled matters, and, and uh, will you be joining the Republicans and maybe uh, trying to maybe rein in his authority in some ways? Um, Matthew, the, the founders of our republic did not envision an autocrat as a chief executive, and the same is true of the founders uh, of the state of West Virginia. Uh, I believe the governor has exceeded his authority in a number of areas, uh, at, at least the way I read the state constitution. Now, he and his, his people say they read it differently. But yes, I do think we need to make it clear that the chief executive ultimately only acts with the permission of the legislative branch. We've got to do that. 
Now, uh, incidentally, when it comes to a flood, all the time that I was in, uh, when, the when the Democrats were in the majority, whenever there was a flood, the governor called us into special session. We were there for a day. We appropriated the money and we went home. I mean, there, it, it's, it's, it's uh, I, 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 I cannot fathom why a governor would be bothered about doing that. Because all, all he or she has to do is present the facts to the legislature, and you're going to get majorities, clear majorities in both houses to say, yes, governor, uh, that's what we think you should do. But the Constitution doesn't give him the authority to do it without the legislature's okay. Matt, uh, I would want to point out something that, uh, you know, uh, John, I think, is suggesting that the governor is acting unconstitutionally in regards to, I think, uh, uh, expending some of the uh, uh, CARES Act and, and, and other uh, uh, stimulus funds that have come from the federal government. Uh, I think one of the issues that, uh, uh, that we discovered early on when looking at that very question is that some of the language in our budgets, and, and these are, uh, this is language that's been included in uh, budgets uh, well before uh, Republicans took uh, uh, control of uh, the, uh, both houses of the legislature back in 2015 does in fact provide uh, authority for the uh, governor uh, when the legislature is not in session uh, to expend federal dollars that are appropriate by the Congress. And again, I think that is, it, but, it, it's but, a bit of a legal wait, argument. Pardon me, let me I interrupt think, you for but, one. But, but, go let ahead. me interrupt you. For, I have a question. Sure. But wouldn't you agree that the the justifications for the, the actions of the governor, uh, you know, people have said, given me this example over and over. Why is the Lowe's, a bustling business, you know, allowed to operate and function like it has throughout this entire uh, episode to date? And yet the local mom and pop restaurant literally can't have a soul in it, uh, you know, and people have pointed out various versions of that. Wouldn't you, wouldn't you, agree that some of the governor's unilateral decisions without any citation of science or, or, or justification uh, of, of some common, I don't know, rationale that's easily understood. I mean, if, if it's out there, why haven't we heard that from him? Uh, maybe you asked, maybe he's given it to legislators, but not to the public. Uh, wouldn't you agree, though, some of those uh, actions have been unilateral and without commonly understood justification and therefore kind of exceeding his authority? Well, Matt, uh, sure. Matt, uh, you're, you're not going to get me to uh, defend uh, every decision that the governor's made, uh, but I will say this. I think, uh, you, know, when, uh, you know, when governors across the country have tried to make some of those type of determinations, uh, in, invariably, you know, you're going to uh, provide uh, some uh, inconsistencies. And I think that's been a frustration for all of us. Now, do I think it would have been a wise use of taxpayer dollars to call us into session back in the throes of a very heated uh, campaign season back, uh, you know, in the latter part of the year running through November? Uh, frankly, no. I think it would have just been a lot of political posturing. And again, uh, you know, I think it's something that requires a thoughtful consideration. That's exactly what we've done uh, over uh, uh, the last uh, several months. We've been drafting legislation to tighten that up to, again, make it very clear that the governor uh, cannot, uh, you know, declare uh, unlimited states of emergency. And again, that'll be legislation that uh, certainly would anticipate that there'll be bipartisan support for that. But I think those were some of the challenges with, again, calling a special session uh, during uh, a very contentious uh, uh, election season. You know, if you think it's, uh, I'll just uh, put it this way, Matt, if you think it, if you think there's inconsistency with one individual, you know, the governor, or obviously he's being advised by others in his administration. If you think that there are inconsistencies with that approach, you know, try having 134 people, uh, you know, essentially the House and the Senate, uh, try to come up with a consistent uh, set of rules and guidelines. I think that could also be the recipe for uh, uh, considerable inconsistency. Perhaps it would not have been a wise use of money, but it's a requirement of the Constitution. 
The Constitution gives the legislature sole responsibility to appropriate money. The governor cannot do it on his own. That is not a function assigned to the executive branch. Now, uh, when I was in the, the, the phrase that's in the, that, that is in the budget bill every year, uh, I agree with Paul. That's been in every year. It was in the the, the uh, uh, 12 years I was uh, vice chair of the finance committee. It was in every time. But all of us understood that it meant specific expenditures. If there was a flood and there was FEMA money that came in that needed to flow through, the governor had the authority to allow that to flow through. But even then, they would call us in later and if any state money had to be expended to match it, we would we would then vote to reappropriate the money to put to put more money back in where where the emergent where wherever the emergency money came from. Um, in terms of of the special session, a one day special session doesn't cost all that much money. Maybe about twenty twenty five thousand dollars of taxpayers' expense. Uh, I think uh, the choice between spending that. And violating the Constitution is clear. I think you have to go by the Constitution. John, you really think we would have uh, agreed in one day back uh, in October uh, on on a course of action? I mean, again, I think there was general agreement among, uh, I think, most legislators that we did need to revisit the authorities of the governor. But I think to suggest that we could have uh, very quickly coalesced behind uh, a, a, a solution Again, right in the middle of a very contentious election, I just uh, I think is uh, overstating the I, likelihood that that could have happened. Oh, but so, gentlemen, so gentlemen, I, I appreciate your uh, your uh, very enthusiastic responses to that issue. In light of the time, let's move on to the next topic Re regarding uh, regarding and what really I think a lot of people care about and believe in as far as what will be critical to the, the future economy. And I know, uh, Delegate Doyle, you mentioned, you know, the importance of education and getting that right in West Virginia and getting our teachers paid more money. But what about broadband? And it comes up and it seems like it's a broken record in West Virginia. Are we going to see real initiatives that bring broadband to West Virginia at large? Even here in Berkeley County, there are dead spots and Jefferson County, I'm sure there are as well. I, in fact, I know there are. Uh, are we gonna see a real broadband advancement this year and this session coming up? Can anybody make a commitment that we're gonna see something in that area? Well, I certainly hope so, Matthew, uh, but- uh, What should we do? Uh, well, we need to appropriate money. And I don't know uh, that we're gonna have enough money to do it without the federal government it may not happen. Uh, the, uh, uh, if, if this were 1932 uh, and Franklin D. Roosevelt had gotten elected president, there would be a program like REA, the Rural Electrification Administration, which used the resources of, of, of federal governments, state governments, local governments, and the private sector to get electricity to everybody. I think we need that kind of program nationally. Uh, you're saying, you're, so you're saying we, that broadband should be a public utility? Is that what you're saying? Yes, absolutely it should be. And What do you uh, say about I, that, Delegate Dole? Do you think it should be a public utility or no? No, I said, I said I, it should be. It and, should and be. What okay. I wanted to, what I was trying to finish with is, oh, sorry. I was very disturbed by the decision yesterday of the Public Service Commission or the day before, whichever day it was, to agree uh, to the, the tiny amount of money that Frontier is willing to put forth to make itself right. It should be spending a whole lot more money than the Public Service Commission is asking them to spend. Delegate Doyle, should it be a public utility? I said yes. No, I'm sorry, Matt, Delegate I, Espin Delegate yeah. Espin sorry, I apologize. I, I thought you were asking me. Uh, well. First, uh, I, I think I'm always a little nervous when uh, folks uh, suggest a, a greater role for the government in actually, you know, carrying out uh, uh, services. Uh, you know, I think uh, unfortunately we see some of the inefficiencies now in a number of areas of state government, and for you know the government to really you know get in as a competitor to the private sector, I think that's always concerning. And 
Yeah, I think it, uh, unfortunately, I, I think it would it, uh, quite possibly uh, have the result of discouraging uh, significant uh, investment in West Virginia. And I'm not just talking about uh, the major incumbent carry in West Virginia. I'm talking about, you know, a half a dozen or more other uh, broadband providers that are making significant investments in broadband. And again, always have uh, some concern with uh, the government, you know, getting in uh, to direct co competition with the private sector. Now, uh, a couple of things, uh, Matt, if, if you'll provide me just a, a little leeway here. Uh, right. I first want to point out that there's probably been uh, at least a half a dozen pieces of legislation that we have enacted in recent sessions to provide additional flexibility uh, for uh, broadband uh, providers to compete. For example, providing additional flexibility for wireless companies to locate their facilities on telephone poles, for example. One of the things we heard from some of the wireless companies who wanted to provide, provide uh, wireless solutions in some of the uh, more urban areas like uh, Charleston, for example, indicated that they were running into challenges getting permission from the incumbent uh, owners of those uh, those uh, structures in order to place their uh, their uh, equipment on those poles. Well, we passed legislation uh, to provide flexibility there. We provided additional flexibility for uh, cities and counties to establish co-ops. If they do, in fact, want to get into a, a co-op type business so that they can provide the services, there is flexibility to do that. But as uh, Delegate Doyle pointed out, uh, he is absolutely right. It's going to take substantial investment in order to provide uh, enhanced broadband. And was very pleased and certainly want to compliment uh, both of our U.S. Senators, uh, uh, Senator Capito, who, of course, has really championed her Capito Connect program, and Senator Manchin, who has also uh, worked very closely with the FCC in helping to ensure that West Virginia will, will be uh, 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 provided a substantial amount of money in this next round of rural uh, broadband enhancement grants. And I don't know the exact number uh, off the top of my head, Matt, but I believe it's somewhere in the range of four or $500 million that I believe West Virginia will receive uh, through uh, that program. And again, uh, through uh, you know other private investment, I do believe that it has the uh, potential of providing uh, uh, certainly enhanced broadband. Frontier, while I'm certainly a little nervous uh, in, in the uh, wake of their recent uh, bankruptcy filing, uh, I did join my colleagues on the House Infrastructure and Technology Committee in writing the, uh, both uh, the FCC and the, and the uh, PSC and urging them to look very closely at uh, Frontier's ability to perform uh, under any grant that they might receive but uh, uh, does so, appear to be the potential, uh, based on at least what Frontier has committed to, providing gig service, and I think uh, 170,000 locations around West Virginia, it does appear to be uh, the, uh, the, the uh, uh, possibility, the, the probability, that we will see significantly enhanced broadband around the state. So given, so given the demand, the, the sheer amount of money needed for this broadband initiative to really be comprehensive and across the state, how can we afford to begin phasing out income tax? I mean, don't we need that money for, for, for initiatives that were, are going to bring more small business, more business to, uh, to West Virginia? Well, again, I would point out that the, the bulk of those dollars that I mentioned, those are federal dollars. Uh, but okay. I, think one of the, I think one of the fallacies uh, that I think John has, has uh, alluded to, I think several times, is that, you know, the, the uh, transition from, uh, from a personal income tax uh, to possibly a consumption tax, that that's a static uh, transition. Uh, I think one of the things that he leaves out is the fact that uh, one of the, um, you know, the stated goals of uh, transitioning our, our taxation system here in West Virginia is to grow our economy. And again, that's one of the things that, you know, we're certainly working very closely with our Department of Revenue uh, officials who are looking at uh, various proposals. We've also um, engaged the uh, WVU School for B Business and Economics to, to look at, you know, various models to see which of those uh, uh, is likely to 
again, if you look at it from a dynamic standpoint, uh, is likely to actually grow the economy, generate additional uh, revenue. And, and again, I think that's the way to provide additional resources for you know, whatever uh, priority you, know, you want to identify in West Virginia. Uh, Matthew, could I follow up on Go that? Uh, and also on the broadband. Uh, Paul's right, we have passed a number of bills that gave additional flexibility uh, to the private sector to improve broadband, and I voted for some of them. I voted for all of the ones that, that came out in the two years that, that, that I've been back in. The problem is it hasn't worked. Uh, and uh, I want to point out that the Rural Electrification Administration that President Roosevelt set up, the government did not compete with the private sector. The government provided incentives to the private sector. And it wasn't only the private sector. There were places where the government did it, but the government acted only in areas where there was no private sector to act. And that's the kind of program that I think needs uh, th th that we need to have. And back on, on the income tax and sales tax again, again, he's advocating precisely what Kansas did, which destroyed Kansas's fiscal and economic condition. But uh, Kansas, I, I, Kansas, we're, Kansas is not West Virginia, though. We were two different states. I mean, how can you compare but, Kansas to West Virginia? Because they did away with the income tax and tried to rot, rely entirely on the sales tax. And it didn't work. And, and well, it, but they're not yeah, an energy John. state. But they're not an energy state. What's they're that not, got to do with income tax and sales tax? Nothing. Well, but, revenue generation, I mean. Matt, I would oh, point out another Virginia, key difference. Oh, 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 if we were willing to double the, the, the severance tax on all natural resources, then uh, a whole lot of things can be on the table. Let's, let's talk about that real quick. Should we return the severance taxes all to the coal fields? Should we give that tax back to them in exchange for uh, the freedom to implement a sales tax? So kind of a local question. Uh, do you, would you be in favor of, of a sales tax allowing counties to have a sales tax? Either one of you, uh, Paul, uh, go ahead. Uh, sure. I'm, in, I'm in favor of letting go counties ahead, have a, oh, a, ahead, a one cent sales tax, an add on to the sales tax. Yes. You're in favor. What about yeah. you, Paul? Are you in favor of 1% for counties? Well, um, I, allowing I, um, counties? I, I'm, I'm sorry, go ahead, say again, Matt. Are you, are you in favor of allowing counties to, to put a 1% sales tax? I mean, the, the governor's asked the, the local counties and local municipalities to share more of the cost of the mark drain. Uh, you know, we obviously are trying to pay our teachers more, uh, you know, here given the cost of living. I mean, are you, are you in favor of allowing the counties to have a 1% sales tax? I'm not a big fan of that, Matt, and I'll tell you why. If you look at my district, uh, the 66th district, you know, I have no municipalities in my uh, district. And uh, so providing the county uh, the opportunity to, to uh, uh, implement an additional 1% uh, sales or a 1% sales tax uh, on top of the existing sales tax, I think would be a direct uh, tax increase on all of my constituents. So it's really not something that I would support. And Frankly, I think if you look uh, at uh, our, our uh, caucuses, uh, and I think there's a, there would be bipartisan concerns for this because most of our uh, uh, legislators do represent rural areas of West Virginia, similar to the 66th district. I think that's gonna be a, you know, a, a heavy lift uh, to get approval for a 1% sales tax. So how do we pay for the mark, the additional shoulder? How do we shoulder that a local share of the mark? Matt, Matthew, Matthew, I need to interject right here. Go I am adamantly opposed to making local governments pay a penny for the mark train. I think it must be done entirely at the state level because commuter rail around the country is funded entirely at the state level. In Maryland and every place else that has commuter rail, they do not ask local governments to fund it. Should we be funding a marked train service, which has, I don't know uh, what the ridership is right at the moment, given the pandemic, but I, I'm sure it's not very high. And I don't think it it's was not very, very high, high. And we're not spending a whole lot of money on it either because the ridership is not very high. It will come back when the pandemic is over. We'll be back to three trains a day. And yes, I think we should be paying for it. And incidentally, Mark, if you compare commuter rail systems around the country, Mark has one of the is one of the high has one of the higher reliances on uh, uh, rider ridership fares. 
to run it. Delegate Espinosa. Well, sure. Well, you know, certainly I've supported efforts to try to, uh, to, our, to uh, our best ability, you know, try to maintain the MARC uh, rail service. Uh, certainly do recognize that it does provide uh, in, um, you know, a, a selling point uh, for uh, Eastern West Virginia, uh, you know, in attracting uh, both uh, businesses and uh, uh, new uh, uh, new uh, you know West Virginians uh, to locate here and be able to travel back and forth. I think certainly, as you noted, Matt, uh, the pandemic uh, has certainly uh, devastated uh, you know a uh, ridership. And uh, while you know, I, I guess I'm hopeful that that ridership will return after the pandemic. I think it kind of remains to be seen. I think you know you know. What we have uh, transitioned to during the pandemic, uh, having a, a greater number of individuals working from home on a regular basis, or at least working from home on a, on a, a part-time basis, I frankly uh, believe, and I think you know, you hear this in, in some of the uh, national media that that's likely to continue even post-pandemic. -pan uh, you add to that, Matt, uh, the uh, Metro Rail, which uh, I believe is extending out to uh, Loudoun County uh, to, to Leesburg, I believe. That certainly will provide an opportunity for folks, uh, particularly in my district, uh, that could quite easily uh, uh, travel down to Leesburg and jump on the Metro once that uh, spur is complete. I, I think, unfortunately, it's going to become, it, it's going to be increasingly uh, challenging in order to maintain uh, the Mark commuter rail for what almost certainly will be declining ridership. Uh, so with the re years. so what so so with the revenue that the Eastern Panhandle residents and taxpayers are generating and sending to Charleston, you're telling me, maybe not, maybe I'm putting words in your mouth, but you're telling me that the state of West Virginia can't afford the whole allocation that Maryland wants to fund the Mark Train. We have Tamarack down there in Raleigh County or whatever county it is. You know, we have these other projects in West Virginia scattered across the state. You're telling me we can't we can't squeeze that amount of money in the budget, and we're still going to ask the local governments to shoulder that. Share? Well, I think it's still, Matt. I, th I still think it comes down to looking at each uh, individual expenditure. I think the challenge is when you uh, look, uh, you know, when you look at total ridership, and again, uh, certainly recognize that uh, ri current ridership uh, obviously has been uh, impacted by the pandemic. But uh, if you look at Whatever the allocation that that uh, uh, the Maryland uh, Transit Authority is is uh, is requesting, uh, you divide that by the number of riders, uh, it uh, becomes very pro problematic. Now, you you mention uh, you know uh, Tamarack and and other uh, expenditures. Yeah, you know, I think we need to look at uh, all expenditures across the state, and uh, right. again, just make sure that they make sense. And again, while I certainly uh, in my heart, support uh, the idea of having uh, commuter rail here uh, in, in eastern West Virginia. I've used the service myself when I've traveled down to D.C. Again, uh, if the ridership is not there, and I think some of the factors that I mentioned are likely to continue to uh, cause a ridership to decline, uh, you know, at some point, uh, certainly it, it, it becomes very, very difficult to justify a multi-million dollar uh, expenditure you know, for, you know, a relatively few number of, uh, of commuters from, from Eastern West Virginia. Uh, Matthew, if, if I could uh, piggyback on that. Paul is right that there's a very good chance that patterns will change as a result of the pandemic. And some of the riders, maybe even many of the riders, will work from home more than they used to. I acknowledge that. But by the same token, there are going to we're going to continue to have people move here who want to ride the train. So I think uh, they're going to balance each other out. Uh, you know, if you'd asked me a year ago, I would have said five years from now, uh, we'd have uh, maybe 20, 25% more riders than we have now. Now we'll probably have five years from now about the same number of riders that we had a year ago. Uh, so he is right about that. Well, I would love nothing. I would love nothing better than for Delegate Doyle to be right in, uh, in this case, and I would love to see ridership, uh, the ridership trend, which unfortunately has not been our friend, has steadily declined in recent years. I'd love to see that reverse, uh, but uh, that's that's what it's going to take, I believe, in order to uh, be able to continue to justify 
uh, millions of dollars in, in funding for that service. And don't you believe, though, that the, the work from home economy depends on good, obviously, quality access to broadband, high speed Internet? And Absolutely. Doesn't, that, doesn't, and again, that doesn't that elevate the importance of that issue for this coming session? I mean, is that the top issue heading into the session or what is the top issue in your view, uh, Delegate Espinosa? Well, I'd say there's probably a dozen or 15, uh, you know, key piece of legislation and certainly broadband legislation is going to be uh, at or near the top of that list. And I've been very pleased that uh, newly elected uh, uh, President of the Senate, uh, Craig Blair, uh, who, of course, uh, represents uh, uh, the, the Eastern Panhandle. Uh, he's been a very strong advocate for broadband and is committed to doing everything that we can to ensure that uh, we do incent uh, deployment of uh, fiber optic cable uh, throughout West Virginia so that we can provide uh, better services for West Virginians who, I think, more now more than ever, are depending on quality broadband in order to work from home and in, in many cases, obviously currently uh, studying from home. Delegate Doyle, should broadband be the top issue going into this session or not? Oh, well, certainly one of them. I think education should be equal to it. Uh, okay. but, uh, I, I, I put those two right at the top and who knows, Matthew, you might bring up another one that I would say, oh yeah, that ought to be there too. I can't think of them all at the same time. Uh, kind of a kind of a, a little bit of a causal and effect kind of question here that I think probably should be asked. Do you believe the Democrat wins at the federal level in the 2020 election will have any bearing on the session uh, agenda coming up? Uh, Is that for me? Delegate, Delegate Doyle, yes. Um, no, not really. Uh, I, I think uh, it, again, when I when the many years that I was in the majority, uh, those things never factored a whole lot. Uh, we we tend to say, okay, here's the situation in West Virginia. Now, uh, every now and then, if somebody proposes a program at the national level that West Virginia can benefit from, then yes, you go after it. And I do think this, Matthew, having having said what I just said. If, in fact, the Biden administration decides to make a big deal out of broadband the way Franklin Roosevelt made a big deal out of electricity, then we better jump on the bandwagon because we're hurting more than almost any other state uh, when, it, when it comes to uh, the availability of broadband. We, we better grab that train, uh, pun intended, when we're talking about Mark, uh, and, 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 and hop on it. Uh, so... Um, Things like that, yes, but only, and the same would be true with infrastructure. Uh, I mean, and broadband would be part of it, but things like water systems. There are so many communities in West Virginia that have water systems that deliver bad drinking water to people. Uh, we have got to do something about that. And I hope, that, hope a, a federal infrastructure bill would include large amounts of money for that sort of thing. Are you satisfied with the current uh, infrastructure efforts of the governor, Delegate Doyle, or do you think we need to do more to respond to the growth of our region? As you know, growth here is an exception to the rule in West Virginia for the most part. Well, no, I am not satisfied at all. And in particular, let me use as an example uh, the so-called Roads, uh, Roads for Progress constitutional amendment or whatever it was called. I voted for it. Uh, this was about three years ago, I think. I voted for it, but I came very close to voting against it. Something like a trillion dollars in three different pockets of money. Of that, how much money went, this is a rhetorical question that I'm gonna answer. How much money went to, to a project in Jefferson, to projects in Jefferson County? Zero. Have we gotten our fair we share? Are, we, we got nothing out of that. So yes, uh, and, and Jefferson County, not only is now the ninth, ninth largest county in the state by population, it also has the highest traffic volume of any county in the state that is not served by an interstate highway. So we should have gotten 
a huge chunk of that for things like finishing 340. Matthew, if 340 had been finished a year and a half ago, then the, the what I call now the Hillsborough problem wouldn't be nearly as bad because people would be able, but right now would be able to drive from Charlestown to, Lee, to Berryville on a four lane road the whole way and then take Route 7 on in. So again, when, when the governor starts thinking about things like infrastructure, for some reason, in his mind, Jefferson County is not part of the state. Delegate Espinosa, do we need to rein in the governor's authority with road construction, or do you feel he's been equitable and fair in that regard as to what uh, Delegate uh, Doyle says? Well, uh, I think Delegate Doyle is forgetting uh, one uh, uh, significant project that is in Jefferson County. Uh, it's actually in my district, and that is the portion of 340 uh, uh, that's currently two lane. Uh, between uh, southern uh, uh, southern Jefferson County and the uh, uh, Virginia line uh, out towards Berryville, and that is one of the roads for trans uh, uh, the the roads to prosperity rather uh, uh, projects. Uh, I think it was one of the larger ones, as I recall. I think there were some in Ber several in Berkeley County, uh, uh, at least my recollection. But I think the one that's uh, there in uh, Jefferson County. I think it cost it will cost tens of millions of dollars up from that particular project. I believe that's pretty close to actually being let. So uh, certainly um, would anticipate that that project will be moving forward here within the next year or two. You know, you should actually see some dirt flying there. Um, but, consi but considering yeah. the revenue, but considering the revenue that Jefferson County generates, and I've heard, I can just hear Commissioner No. Considering the amount of money that the revenue from the racetrack and from everything else that's awesome and wonderful about Jefferson County and, and, and the Eastern Panel as a whole, I mean, are we getting our fair share of road construction funds back from Charleston? Are we getting our, do you feel that we are, Delegate Espinette? Are we getting our fair share? And should we, if we're not, should we be doing something uh, to tweak the formula? What, you know, what should we be doing if we're not getting it, in your opinion? Sure. Well, I'm certainly going to continue to advocate for uh, additional dollars, our fair share of dollars from the state. I think one of the things that certainly uh, uh, Jefferson County and the Eastern Panhandle has going for it is growth. I think is, and as a result of growth and various projects that uh, do require additional infrastructure, that certainly is uh, having a positive impact in uh, providing uh, additional uh, infrastructure, including roads, in order to serve uh, you know, uh, certain uh, projects uh, here in the Eastern Panhandle. I think it's much more difficult to uh, sometimes justify a project in a very rural area of West Virginia where you don't have a major uh, project uh, that's uh, been proposed for an area. But uh, uh, again, I think it's important to recognize that the Roads for Prosperity uh, program, you know, that was put out for West Virginia voters. West Virginia voters ultimately had to say there is whether they felt that that was a good way to expend uh, the bond monies that, that were uh, through that bond sale. Uh, and you're saying so, you're sat and you're satisfied with that program. Well, always would love to see more projects in, in uh, West Virginia, uh, or I'm sorry, in Jefferson County. I would say that in addition to some of the big projects like the uh, 340 South uh, uh, project that I mentioned, uh, I am aware, I've, I receive regular updates from the uh, Department of Highways regarding other projects, uh, maintenance type projects, widening of, of various roads. So, you know, I think uh, uh, the Department of Highways, I think is uh, trying to do their best to ensure that each uh, transportation district around West Virginia does get uh, some of their significant needs uh, addressed. Uh, would I love to see more? Absolutely. Uh, but again, it's uh, certainly a challenge when you have the number of road miles uh, throughout West Virginia. You have the number of uh, orphan roads, uh, similar to some of the ones that I have in my district up in the Shenandoah area that obviously are a challenge, continue to be a challenge. Uh, it is a very, very big uh, uh, challenge to meet. And um, uh, fortunately, uh, the Department of Highways does have those additional dollars to at least address some of the most pressing projects uh, around West Virginia. Delegate Doyle, uh, quickly. Matthew, yeah. Uh, I think Paul, uh, uh, Paul said I ignored 340 South. 
uh, right after I had specifically pointed that out as an example of a road that was ignored by the bond. Uh, I remember when the bond came out and the governor identified the projects and I asked the Division of Highways, why is 340 uh, to, from, from uh, 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 south of Charlestown to the Virginia line toward Berryville, why is that not an identified project? And the answer was, well, it doesn't need to be, but if you pass this bond issue, uh, it will move uh, the, the, the uh, schedule of that road from being five years away to three years away. But it was not identified as a project uh, in, in that bond issue. Not one single project in Jefferson County out of the whole trillion dollars was but identified. You agree, but project. you agree, but you agree that's been corrected, correct? I mean, no, it has been, not been corrected. They're spending it. It's it, it, unless uh, unless a change was made. But when you pass a bond issue and you say these are the projects, those are the projects the money has to be spent on. Now we still have the regular federal money coming in, and and because some of those projects had been uh, had had uh, first year, second year, third year priorities, then went over to the bond issue. That did, in fact, move 340 a couple of years ahead of schedule. But uh, my point is, had 340 been identified as a project for the bond issue, uh, it would be under construction now, maybe even finished. Uh, well, I've been advised by the uh, Secretary of Transportation, Bird White, that that project is, in fact, funded. Not uh, uh, sure precisely what bucket it's coming out of, but I think that's somewhat irrelevant. The fact is that it is funded and uh, will be let uh, relatively soon so that uh, 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 construction of that project can, can, uh, uh, can proceed. My point is, Paul, it should have been sooner. Well, I guess everything, <laughs> you think everything should be sooner and I, and I, no, I, I don't think everything sooner should as well, be sooner. But, I do but, think uh, that should have been sooner. Yeah. I wanna give each of you and kind of closing here, a, a couple minutes to talk about your priorities, what you really are, really looking forward to tackling in this upcoming session. I know we didn't talk about all the topics. If you wanna to touch on something we haven't touched on, a particular proposal you might've introduced in the past, you wanna you know, give it another go this, uh, this session. As we know, sometimes it takes three, four or five sessions to get something through. Uh, feel free, starting with Delegate Doyle, uh, you know, just list off a couple things, uh, two or three items that you really see as some uh, topic, uh, issues, legislative items you really want to see get some, at least some attention, if not through the, the legislature this year. Uh, one is an issue called power purchase agreements, uh, which uh, allows people who put solar panels on their home to basically sell some of the power from that to the power company. And the net effect is to lower their, their electric bill. Uh, a, a bill like that was introduced in the Senate last year uh, by Charlie Trump. Uh, it was not introduced in the House. I've talked to several other delegates and we're gonna make sure that that bill gets introduced in the House this year. Uh, another is, uh, I've been working with the Delegate Evan Hansen from, from Morgantown on a major rewrite of our election laws. Uh, it's a comprehensive rewrite. And it's gonna have things in it like mandated uh, 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 ballot drop boxes uh, uh, around every county. Uh, it's, it's, gonna, uh, it's gonna require counties the size of Jefferson to have more than one um, uh, early voting location. There are a number of things like this. And, and the basic idea is to make it easier for people to vote. Delegate Espinosa. Well, in addition to some of the topics that I've uh, discussed this evening, I think another area that I'm really excited about the potential for enacting some common sense reform is in the uh, area of licensure, uh, you know, particularly in the building trades. And, you know, one of the things that I've been, been uh, made aware of here uh, in, the, in the last uh, several years is the fact that, you know, West Virginia you know, has some of the most onerous uh, requirements for those uh, uh, seeking to enter the building trades. And, uh, you know, I think we all are, are aware uh, that you know, it's becoming increasingly difficult to attract individuals to some of those building trades, whether it be a plumber or an electrician. And I think if you look at the uh, requirements for individuals who wish to enter uh, those building trades here in West Virginia, 
compared to our surrounding states and other states around the country, uh, again, they're just nonsensical. And uh, we've uh, you know, had some modest success in recent years and trying to reduce uh, some of those uh, onerous requirements. Uh, but uh, I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic uh, based on the fact that we do now, do now have a super majority in the House and Senate. We no longer have to rely on uh, our Democratic colleagues who have resisted uh, some of that reform in the past to enact meaningful reform that again, lowers those barriers to entry so that those individuals that do wish to enter the building trades can do so uh, without having to meet um, excessive requirements that are much, much greater than any of our surrounding states or states around the country. And again, uh, with uh, being a state uh, that has one of the lowest workforce participation rates in the country, while we have seen some improvement, particularly before the pandemic, in improving our workforce participation rate, uh, we simply can't continue to make it difficult for those individuals that want to uh, enter the workforce to do so. So very uh, uh, anxious to enact some meaningful licensure reform to lower the barrier to entry uh, for those individuals. Gentlemen, I really appreciate your time tonight and hopefully uh, the audience found what we talked about uh, somewhat meaningful in between my interruptions and, and uh, abrupt uh, insertions of commentary. Uh, that will do it uh, for our forum tonight on behalf of the Stubblefield Institute for Civil Political Communications and the Civil Civic Engagement Committee. I wanna thank uh, obviously both of you, uh, Delegate Doyle and, and Delegate Espinosa for a great program. I also wanna thank our producer, Sarah Burke for making it all happen. Uh, thank you all for tuning in and uh, good night everyone. Good night. Thank you. Good night.